Welcome to Vertical City. I'm your host, Lennon Richardson. During each episode, I interview one of the world's top experts in architecture, urban design, engineering, or ecology, so that we can better understand and develop solutions for sustainable living. Thank you for listening, and get ready to join us on another groundbreaking and uplifting episode. Narendra Varma was born and raised in India. In 1986, he moved to the United States to attend Brown University, where he obtained a degree in educational technology. After graduation, he went to work for Microsoft Corporation, retired early, and then spent some time traveling the world. Narendra later became passionate about permaculture design and biodynamic agriculture as he began to recognize the flaws in our modern agricultural system. In 2010, Narendra, his wife, and two kids moved to Portland, Oregon, and purchased a 58-acre farm in order to found Our Table. Our Table is a cooperative of farmers and producers that produce local food for the Portland community by blending the wisdom of the past with modern-day science. In this interview, we discuss Our Table's innovative business approach, biodynamic agriculture, the problems with the modern industrial food system, and the role that locally produced food might play to alleviate these problems. Helpful show notes and links regarding everything we discuss in this interview can be found by visiting verticalcity.org slash podcast. Narendra, welcome to the Vertical City Podcast. Thank you. I'm glad to have you on as a guest. Uh, I want to start by framing this around climate change Lately, I've heard a lot of debate about, um, you know, the issue of climate change. Some people are arguing that it's not really taking place, and others argue that if it is taking place, it's not in fact man-made. And I just want to get your take on this and see what are your thoughts on the issue. Well, I, in my mind, there's no question at all. Um, my understanding is that, um, you know, well, my experience, let me say, is that climate change is real, and I mean my experience as a farmer. As to what is causing it, in my mind, there's no question that uh, certainly uh, man-made um, you know, uh, factors are a major factor. Are they the only factor? I don't know. I'm not a climate scientist. Okay. How does the industrial food system play into climate change? Well, I think agriculture is acknowledged to be a very large emitter of uh, carbon dioxide um, emissions and greenhouse gas emissions in general. Um, and that when I say agriculture, I mean just sort of our modern industrial agricultural system because certainly um, – um, more ecological agricultural systems don't suffer from this problem. So, um, again, I don't necessarily have the uh, figures at my fingertips, but my understanding is that uh, industrial agriculture is a very large contributor towards uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. And I know you're a big proponent of uh, locally sourced food. How do you see the local food movement playing into this as, as a potential means of correcting these problems? Well, so one, I think one mis a potential misconception, because we're talking about sort of industrial agriculture versus local food, I think a lot of people hear those words local and think that um, it must be because we're reducing what's called food miles. So if the food is traveling a shorter distance between, the, let's say, where it was grown and where I am eating it, uh, then that is going to save a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions. And that is true, but only to a small extent. The largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions um, from agriculture has got nothing to do with the uh, transportation of the food from the field to the table, although that does um, have um, you know, some contribution. But it's really about how the food is being grown and the extremely high level of uh, petrochemical-based inputs, whether it's in the form of fuel to drive machinery um, in the on the farm, or more importantly, in the form of petrochemical fertilizers and um, pesticides uh, that are used, that are applied to the crops. So those uses are far far larger um, than the than the actual transportation. So it's not so much about um, uh, local versus uh, far away. Uh, that's the issue. It's really more about the type of farming. Uh, now, that's not to say that, that local isn't important, but I think it's important for a lot of other reasons as well. Mm. Okay. Um, so it sounds like organically grown food would be a better way of fighting climate change than locally grown food, if you had to choose one or the I, other. 
Uh, well, no, not necessarily. Um, <laughs> it, unfortunately, there's a lot of subtleties and complexities here. So mm-hmm. um, I, I don't think it's fair to say a blanket statement like organic um, is better for uh, from a greenhouse gas perspective than locally grown. It, it's all about how it's grown. So organic by an, in and of itself, um, unfortunately, um, is simply a, a prescriptive standard for the types of uh, inputs that a farmer cannot use. Okay? okay, it doesn't really talk about what a farmer uh, should do instead. It used to, and certainly the original intent of the organic standard was more about you know here are the things that that we value uh, in the system, and here are some ways to get there. And it still does to some extent, but it's become more and more about here are the things you cannot use, the, the, the substances that are banned, and a different set of artificially created substances or, or naturally mined substances uh, that are allowed. Okay, So it, 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 it's, it's really become more about that than it is about things like building soil health or farming in a way that is more in tune with nature, which are its roots. And I think if those roots are followed, then the results, uh, even in things like greenhouse gas emissions, are incredibly uh, ex- you know, good. But if you're simply farming organically and instead of using a petrochemically de- derived pesticide, you're using a plant derived pesticide, um, you know, th- there's nothing to say that your, your greenhouse gas emissions are any lower. Okay? I see. If you have a 5,000 acre organic lettuce farm, your greenhouse gas emissions are probably about the same as a 5,000 acre. M- you know, industrial uh, agri- or chemical agriculture lettuce farm. The, the distinction there is in practices like large monocultures, in practices like scale, scales that are really too large um, for human beings and require a heavy use of machinery. So as a concerned consumer, what can I do to know that my, the food I'm, I'm purchasing and consuming is not having a significant uh, contribution to global warming? Is there a way I can tell? I mean, I know that. Um, yes, I think I think the best way, and uh, I mean, people argue that it's not very practical, but I, I think it is, uh, is really to build uh, relationships with the people providing your food and, and to get to know them and to understand where they are, which means by de- default um, that it's local, right? Because you can't build relationships with somebody far away. You don't know who they are. Um, it also means by default that the supply chain is short because you're having a direct face-to-face interaction with the person growing the food or even with the, with the store that you're buying the food from. I mean, the, the more you build direct relationships, the more you have a knowledge about how, how things are getting to you, how they're being grown and processed, et cetera, and who the people are who are doing these things, and you build a level of trust. And I think that is the best way to do that. You have to build relationships. It has to be less faceless. I see. I imagine that that's how things were historically done, always until just the modern era. Yes, and when we think of the modern era, I mean, we're not talking about a thousand years ago. We're talking about you know fifty, sixty years ago in in in, in even uh, develop in uh, industrialized nations, and you know maybe twenty or thirty years ago in a lot of other places in the world. And there are many places in the world where people still work on rela- on you know independent relationships. So uh, you know there's there's a lot of mythology around um, industrial agriculture, around the issue of sort of we need it to feed the world. But the thing that everybody forgets is that. Um, According to the, the to the United Nations, uh, industrial agriculture today provides less than thirty percent of the world's food. Wow! Okay? The fifty percent of the world's food today comes from what the United Nations report that I'm referring to refers to as peasant agriculture. Okay, oh. or basically agroecological methods, like traditional farming methods. Okay, on a much smaller human scale. Um, the remaining twenty percent. Um, is coming from basically what they would call wild crafting, which is most 99% of that is fishing, okay, okay. where it's not farmed fish, but it's wild fishing. Okay, that's interesting. I'm, I'm really surprised about that. I would have guessed that industrial agriculture was the mechanism feeding the world. No, and this is exactly the problem. So, so you have a system really that A, doesn't feed the world, and yet all of its kind of messaging and marketing is that we need it to feed the world, especially with a growing population. Okay, I mean that this is a constant refrain in the media and in the propaganda that this industry kind of puts out and relies on is that, you know, we're going to get to nine billion people soon and everybody's going to starve unless we do this, this, and this. Okay, mm-hmm. um, but the fact is, it doesn't feed the world today, and it never has. So, um, you know, I think, and it contributes 
to, to things like greenhouse gas emissions with climate change and, you know, vast ecological destruction, um, you know, of a, of a different kind of nature with pollution of, of water and air and, and soil and things like that, you know, with many, many other kind of ecological problems and social problems that we don't really discuss, okay, all while not feeding the world. Mm-hmm. Wow. All right. So I want to ask a question of, of clarification first. There mm-hmm. must be some sort of gradation between like hyper local and industrial farming, right? There... Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Um, but in your eyes, in a perfect world, would we totally do away with industrial farming and would everything become more locally produced? Doesn't have to be necessarily hyper local, but maybe regionally. Well, I mean, I think it depends a little bit on how you define industrial. So, okay. um, g- generally speaking, um, it, it, it's a question of scale, right? So, are you, are you saying that there should be, there should, am I going to say there should never be a thousand acre, you know, farm. No, I'm not going to say that at all. I think scale can be done. And there are certain things that make sense at scale. There are certain efficiencies you get. Um, On the other hand, um, we have to acknowledge that large scale monoculture farms, because you can't grow a thousand acres of diverse crops. Okay, you just you just don't. Um, On the other hand, if you have a thousand acres and you want to grow a crop, I think there are methods, there are age old methods, there are modern methods that can be used with things like cover cropping and crop rotations um, and things like that. Uh, Again, without necessarily using petrochemical, um, you know, pesticides and things to uh, and still have a monocrop at a time. So you're still growing maybe wheat in one block and maybe, let's say, soybeans or, or lentils or something like that in another block. Uh, and you're not growing the, the wheat and the, and the lentils together in the same field because it's less efficient to, to harvest and things like that. Mm-hmm. But you're rotating those fields so that the, the same wheat is not being grown on the same field for 20 years. Right? That there's a rotation which keeps the soil healthy, it reduces pest pressure, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So there are many ways to kind of do things at, at a larger scale while still getting a lot of the benefits of a, a polyculture of diversity in space and time. It takes a little bit more management, but we have lots of age-old examples of this, and we have lots of modern research into this that, that allows us to kind of do, do it better. Um, the, the thing to always worry about is that when we get to a scale that is sort of beyond uh, the imagination of a single human being, then generally speaking, we're relying on heavy machinery to do the, all the lifting. So it tends to be uh, machine-intensive in, and labor-efficient, um, let's call it, okay, low labor inputs. Um, because everything is such a large scale, you can't really do it by hand anyway. Uh, when you do that, then I think you sometimes, or there's a lot of temptation to fall prey to thinking about efficiencies in a very narrow kind of um, numeric and quantitative way. And not really, and for losing sight of the fact that what you're doing is really working in a natural ecological system, and you can't get away from that. That as much as we would love to control nature, the fact is that we are a part of it. We can't really control it. Okay, so I think that's where the fallacies lie. That's where the traps lie. Um, but I do believe that that you know, with with a certain amount of care um, and wisdom, people can do that. So it sounds like to me one of the statements that you're making there is that. With large scale, because you're not having your, you're not getting your hands dirty, your perspective mm-hmm. gets off. Uh, it's not so much that you're not getting your hands dirty. Um, I, I think there are lots of large scale farmers out there who care very deeply about their land, who care very deeply about the soil, who feel very deeply about all of these things. I think the problem is that when you work at that scale, you have no choice but to, you know, the, the, the potential. The economics at some level, the, 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 the same things that the economics professor will tell you are great efficiencies, right, are the same things that don't work very well in a complex ecological system. They work because you assume away the complexities of that system. You look at it and you go, well, I'm not going to worry about this thing because that's way too complicated. I'm just going to roughshod all over it with big machinery or chemicals or whatever other sort of tool I can bring to just ignore that problem. Well, those problems can't, don't go away. So, so take the example, for um, you know, with the heavy use of, of um, herbicides with um, genetically modified crops. Most genetically modified crops that are uh, in commercial production today are not designed to provide any kind of benefit to the farmer or to the consumer. Okay? They're designed to, to basically uh, resist um, some kind of um, herbicide, right? 
the idea being that then the farmer can apply the herbicide, um, you know, carte blanche over the entire field, and the crop they want won't die, but everything else will. Well, this is not a benefit to the farmer because it ends up costing a lot more than other methods, but it's a great benefit to the company who makes these things, okay, because, of course, they not only make the seed, but they also make the herbicide. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with this system is that it has increased herbicide use uh, you know, 10, 20 times, or even even higher in, in, in the last few decades as these crops have become popular. Um, so you can argue, well, okay, well, never mind, doesn't really matter because, you know, we, we other things make up for it. Maybe. But regardless, the fact remains that we're working with a natural system. So what happens is that, as expected, as any, you know, 10th grade biology student can tell you, What's going to happen in that system is that you're creating an artificially kind of scarce environment, okay, and you're creating the conditions for evolution to evolve a, a, a version of those same weeds and things that you're trying to get rid of that are going to be resistant to that herbicide. And that's exactly what's happening. We have these what they call super weeds, which are essentially herbicide resistant, which then means that the farmer has to spray even more herbicides or different kinds of herbicides, but you're constantly fighting evolution. You're not going to win eventually life will always win, right? Yeah. Anytime you, you kill off everything else in the field, some other uh, creature or plant is going to see that as an ecological niche and evolve to fill that ecological niche. Mm -hmm. Nature abhors a vacuum. So you're constantly going to be fighting this battle. Now, for the chemical company, that's not a bad thing. It means now I have to develop a new chemical that can kill that thing too, so then you have to buy another one, and guess what? This one's going to be more expensive. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. For the farmer, it's a disaster. And for us as a civilization, it's a disaster. If industrial farming is not ecological or is not economically beneficial to the farmer, then mm -hmm. why are 30% of the farms in the world on this industrial scale? <laughs> it's, it's not beneficial to the farmer. It's beneficial to the companies the, that, that not just make these products, but to the entire sort of financial and economic system that supports them. Okay, and that finances them. The farmers are usually stuck in a debt trap. They they cannot not do it because they are, they their scale requires them to generate that level of of revenue every single year. And then you have this system underneath it all, which says that if for any reason your crop fails, you're going to get a, a government um, you know insurance or subsidy uh, to, st to 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 help you. And that's fine, except that again. It's set up so that you only get that subsidy if you grow these kinds of crops, okay? So it becomes a vicious cycle for the farmer. The farmers are trapped in this vicious cycle. The people who it benefits are the financiers, okay? So we're talking Wall Street because they tend to kind of finance all of this and make a lot of money out of it, um, whether that's in commodity speculation or whether that's in actually direct financing of, of, these, of the companies that make these products. And it helps the agrochemical companies. That's who it helps. The other thing that it creates, and this is the reason that the public generally doesn't complain about it, is that it allows us to produce extremely cheap calories. Mm -hmm. Okay, Calories. I didn't say food for a reason. Okay. Right? Um, so it, it allows us to produce very cheap calories. Now, you can argue, and I would certainly argue this, that these cheap calories are, are not truly cheap. Okay, What you're really doing is you're shifting the cost of production in time and space. By creating pollution, by creating a dead zone in the, in the gulf the size of a you know, small state, um, you're, crea you're creating a problem that our future generations are going to have to deal with, and the cost of which will be far greater than what we're saving today. Okay? You're, creating, you're contributing to climate change. I mean, it's, it's staggering to think about you know, the fact that we are essentially killing the planet because we want cheap calories today. I mean, like, how does that compute in anybody's calculus, right? At the same time, you're all, or alternatively, I should say, you're also shifting costs in space. So we go, well, you know, it's expensive for us to do this in America, so we're going to go to Mexico or to China where labor is cheaper and maybe the environmental laws aren't as strict and we're going to do it over there. So we're shifting the costs onto other people or we're shifting the costs in time. Um, so I would submit that those calories are not accurately priced. And, and this is not just true in agriculture. It's true in a lot of different uh, things in our society today, right? We just shift costs to other places or in time to the future generations. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I, I don't think that it's actually cheap, but in, in today's dollars on a daily basis, it feels cheap. You can go to the grocery store and buy gobs and gobs of, of empty calories for absolutely nothing. I mean, think about, right. you know, buying soda, for example, or sugar water. 
You know, it's just carbonated sugar water. Um, you know, that's a lot of calories, and it's ultra, ultra cheap. But is it is it nutritious? Is it food? I would argue no. And I think we as a civilization are starting to see the results of that over a period of time. Now, if I go and drink a you know a soda, um, it doesn't immediately kill me or hurt me, right? The effects are not immediate. The effects are long term, cumulative, complex interacting with all sorts of other factors that we don't really understand. But we know we have a public health crisis, and that's not just in America. It's all over the planet now. As people move to the so-called Western diet that's high in, in sugars and carbohydrate and these same cheap calories that industrial agriculture is so good at producing, we see their health deteriorate. Those so-called Western metabolic syndrome diseases coming on, heart disease, diabetes, obesity. I mean, how do you count the cost of these things to society? Yeah, so. right. it's not just in dollars and cents. It's a much deeper problem. Right? Right. I mean, if you, if you lose a loved one, it has a much bigger impact on you uh, than just simply the potential lost income from that person. Yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying. The industrial food system is cheap, but it's only cheap when you're looking at the immediate cost, and you know it's just a quick fix. And over time, yeah, it's cheap on on a spreadsheet when you're looking at a right. very very constrained mm-hmm. time frame. The minute you look beyond the spreadsheet, it's not cheap at all, even in the in that short time frame. Okay, because of all the externalities like the environmental Correct. destruction and everything like that. Yeah, so, yeah, and the, and the social community destruction to, to communities. I mean, you know, we have no rural communities left in this country anymore because of this. So, how does your farm differ from the situation? What are some well, of the our farm is, is yeah, is, you know, is an attempt um, and at some level an experiment uh, to, to sort of under the realization that we need to figure out what a more mo- a contemporary local food system looks like. We don't really know what the answers are. You know, there's lots of people doing great things, um, and we certainly stand on the shoulders of giants. But it, at the end of the day, we are at a position where we don't really know what, we, what the future should look like. Uh, we have some values in mind. And we can learn from the past, but we don't want to go back to, you know, what our great grandparents had. The world is a very different place, um, right? And it's not going to serve our needs today. So we need to create a new system. Uh, so our feeling is that in order to do that, the, the entire sort of, um, uh, you know, community has to come together and figure out what does this thing look like and how does this thing work? So what we try to do is say, you know, we, we want to be um, involved in food all the way from the seed to the belly of the person that's eating it, you know, uh, into their kitchens. And we want all of those people to come together around the proverbial table to kind of figure out how this should work and how and, and what, the, what, what, we, what we want it to be. So we created um, essentially a multi-stakeholder cooperative that says that everyone who's involved in food all the way from the sort of the farmer to the, you know, the grocery clerk to the delivery driver to the person eating the food at their own house um, are all involved in this. Um, they're all owners of this one vertically integrated organization, all the surpluses of which are shared amongst those owners, um, and they control it. So it's a, it's a community-scale food system owned and run by the community. Now, you know, I'm not going to tell you that we have a great successful model. Okay? It's very new. It's, um, it's not profitable yet, which means it's not financially self-sufficient, okay? which obviously means it's not sustainable in the long run un- until we can get there. Um, but it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation. There are lots of things that I'm sure we do uh, poorly and that we can do better or differently, that, you know, bad ideas. There are other things that I'm sure were good ideas. So all that remains to kind of get worked out and be seen as how it all sort of pans out. So the system you're just describing, this is our table, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Also, I saw on your website that you're working towards uh, something called biodynamic certification. Can you explain what that is and how it's different than organic? Yeah, so biodynamic um, is really about a, um, a philosophy um, and not so much a prescription. So it's, um, it's about closing loops. And the entire philosophy essentially sees the farm and even the community that the farm is in as sort of a single organism. And all of the components of that are sort of like the organ. So the farmer is simply like an organ in this organism. Okay, It's not, it's not more or less important than, than any other component. Um, it's a symbiotic relationship. So um, the idea is that if you see it as a single organism, then you you cannot have externalities. Okay, all the loops have to be closed. And biodynamic farming is about being conscious about 
all the time about closing loops. That's its fundamental principles. Okay. Uh, this, the second fundamental principle is 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 this very very deep uh, seated sort of um, working with nature philosophy. Okay. Um, so it's it's I would call it far beyond organic in its focus on loop closing and on on sort of the health of soil and ecology. Um, but it's you know it's a, it's not a it's not a new thing. It's been around for a very long time. There's lots of people all over the planet doing it, and uh, not necessarily even calling it biodynamics. You know, there's lots of different versions of it. If you go um, to countries um, you know where sort of more older agricultural traditions still thrive, uh, and this end up being more sort of developed non-industrialized countries or not as heavily industrialized countries, um, a lot of the sort of ancient agricultural traditions are very very similar. They have a lot in common. Um, and, and, you know, that's wisdom learned over the ages. And much of it is still highly applicable today. And, in fact, with modern technology and, the, and sort of scientific knowledge, I think the marriage is, is fascinating and very, very um, useful because we have some modern tools and technologies and understandings that can help us apply some of these uh, ancient techniques in, in a better way. When you talk about loop closing, are you basically, you mean accounting for all the costs, even the external costs? Uh, it's not just costs; it's also inputs. Uh, you know, and and I and of course, uh, if you if I'm bringing in fertilizer from somewhere else, okay, then yes, there's a dollar cost to that, and accounting for that is important, okay, um, from an economic perspective. But it's also a question of from an ecological perspective: where are these inputs coming from? In a biodynamic system, you try and create all of your fertility and your inputs within the farm. Okay, or within the community around the farm. So, for example, I don't go and buy a fertilizer from some random place in a bag. I have to have um, livestock either on my farm or on the neighbor's farm or somewhere like that that has an excess of that fertilizer of manure that I can then compost and put on my soil so that I close that loop. And then maybe the soil is then growing the plants that are feeding those animals. So it, it ends up being a far more uh, sort of ecological approach because in, in nature there's no such thing as externalities. It's a, you know, it's a closed loop entirely. Mm-hmm. Very little stardust falls to the earth every, uh, you know. I mean, the only real externality in nature is that we get free energy from the sun, Right. Solar energy is the only input. Everything else on the planet is a closed loop, really. Okay. So it's, it's, it's that form of thinking. That makes sense to me, aligning the, your way of measurement with the way nature works. Yes. All right. So, so there's, no, there's no surpluses. There's no um, you know, scarcity. It's, it's a balanced loop. On your farm, you're doing – I imagine that you're doing lots of different practices and then documenting everything that you do. Then what happens when you're moving towards biodynamic certification? Yes, and I mean, documenting uh, sounds like we're, we're conducting sort of a more, um, you know, scientific experiment. I wouldn't say it's that formal. Um, yes, we document things uh, because of, of requirements from certification agencies and things, and for our own record keeping, but not, uh, you know, as a sort of scientific experiment. We're not trying to produce a paper at the end of this. We're trying to feed our community. Right. So how do you go about getting bio- biodynamic certification then? There's a certification body that's um, national and international certification bodies. There are manuals. That, you know, you follow certain um, uh, guidelines. But what's interesting about biodynamic certification versus organic is that it's uh, acknowledged that it's a lifelong process. You don't ever get there. You're always on. You're just on the right path. Okay. So you're constantly improving. With organic, you can you can the way the certification is set up, not its original philosophy, is that you can achieve a certain status uh, based on what you do and don't do, and then get your certificate. And after that, as long as you just stick to those things, uh, you can keep your certification with uh, annual inspections, etc. Uh, but with biodynamics, it's acknowledged far more that you're on a path, and you get your certification when you've met certain threshold levels of being on that path. And then it's, you know, it's a lifelong process. You never stop. You continually improve. Because today you might say, well, I'm buying for you know, this particular kind of mineral in a bag because my soil is deficient in it. But you're constantly thinking about how do I make my soil not deficient in this mineral, not by adding it from the outside, but by creating the conditions where the natural systems will allow that to occur. Okay, without me adding inputs from the outside. So do I need to crop differently in this area? Do I need to have animals and, and, and plants and stuff in a more integrated way in this area, which will then create those balances? Okay? I see. So it's, it's, a, it's a process. It's not an end goal. I remember maybe just 10 or 15 years ago when organic, I 
probably had no idea what that meant. And now it's, it's such a household name. Do you mm-hmm. see mm-hmm. in the future, will biodynamic become something that consumers are looking for and they'll be able to just look at the little icon on their food products <laughs> and know if it's biodynamic um, or not? Um, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, that's hard for me to say. I, I don't really particularly care one way or the other. I mean, I think for me, it, it would be nice. But for me as a farmer, it's like we don't do it because there's a marketing benefit. We do it because we think it's the right thing to do. And it's the best way to farm, uh, in our opinion, and creates the best results, not only just in terms of yield or better crop for me to sell, but also higher nutritional value and better soil and better health for, for me and for the people who are eating the food. So I want to loop back for a second to what you said about the practicality of getting to know your farmers and food producers. I can see that definitely working in a small community, but would that work in a large city where a lot of the food isn't grown even anywhere near where it's consumed? How does that, how would that well, happen? Well, to me, that's, a, that's the problem. The problem is that the food isn't grown anywhere near where it's consumed. So, for example, um, I'll give you two examples. One is, you know, modern-day Havana grows a, a large percentage, the vast majority of its, of its vegetables within city limits. OK, uh, this is Cuba we're talking about. Yeah. So um, and, and that was, you know, there's an interesting history there. When the Soviet Union collapsed, um, you know, the, the, the Cuban um, you know, agricultural system essentially collapsed with it because it was a, a system that essentially they had borrowed from the Soviets. It was industrial agriculture, but it relied heavily on petrochemical inputs, just like all industrial agriculture does. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed and they were not uh, basically, uh, you know, supporting Cuba anymore, Cuba had no oil of its own or no petrochemical industry of its own. So it didn't have access to the, to the diesel and to the petrochemicals that this system requires. Well, immediately, Cuban agriculture collapsed without wow. these inputs. And they had no choice but as a country, you know, they call it in Cuban, the Cubans call it the special period because their caloric intake for the average Cuban went from like 20 or 2,200 or something like that calories per day, which is sort of what the American uh, government also recommends uh, for an adult, down to something like 14 or 12 or 1,400, okay? So they, they suffered greatly for a couple of decades while the country essentially retooled and said, you know what? We don't have access to this stuff. We've got to go back. To, we've got to switch to a different agriculture. Now, they didn't just say, let's go back the way grandpa did things. Okay, it was much deeper than that. They transitioned all of their university research departments into going, we don't have chemical pesticides. You're going to figure out how to make natural things or natural systems that either don't require those pesticides or, you know, natural ways to fight those pests. Okay. You, they, they changed their sort of the way they, they, they allowed people to use land. All vacant lots uh, in the city were converted into like, you can go and start a little micro farm. Okay. It was very entrepreneurial, far more sort of capitalist than one would think. Okay. Very, I mean, you know, you're in China right now. You understand that there's a certain level of sort of entrepreneurial activity in a country that is ostensibly non-capitalist, right, in, in its sort of system. Yeah. That's far greater than what you see in America today, okay, which is sort of the, the, the worldwide uh, champion of capitalism, right? Um, so, so, you know, it's not for lack of entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, even within a sort of socialist communist system. Um, so they allowed people to go do this. They allowed a gazillion micro farms to come up. People were growing food on their balconies, on their rooftops, and being able to sell it to their neighbors. It wasn't just grow it for yourself. Okay? Um, and in a couple of decades, they completely retooled to where now Havana is essentially self-sufficient in fruits and vegetables. Yes, the grains come from outside, but that goes back to where grains don't really, are not really appropriate to be grown you know, on a rooftop, right? I mean, they require that larger scale. So, um, you know, the farms outside the city tool to kind of doing that in an ecological way. And within the city, they were able to do it, uh, you know, in this in, in this sort of much smaller scale with lots of people. Right? It's more labor intensive. It is more labor intensive. And we can talk a little bit about that later, about sort of the, uh, you know, efficiency of of uh, the smaller scale agriculture versus industrial agriculture. Sure, we should. You said you have a second example you wanted to share? Oh, so second example. I'll give you a more personal example. When okay. I was a kid uh, growing up in, in New Delhi, okay, New Delhi was a city that uh, even, even in those days, you know, 30 years ago, uh, had a much larger population than most, let's say, American cities anyway, okay, uh, not Chinese cities. But, um, and yet, you know, uh, the huge majority of the food was coming in every single day from farms within the local area, okay, 
It was all because of, of small-scale agriculture. I mean, in, in India in those days, there were no large-scale farms. It wasn't al- you weren't allowed to own more than 30 acres of land. Okay? Everything was much, much smaller scale. And, you know, there was food coming in every single day into the, into the vegetable, you know, uh, wholesale markets um, and all of it. I mean, not just vegetables. It was coming in every single day so from the local area with very, very simple transportation networks. It wasn't this highly, you know, industrialized system. And we were perfectly fine. You know, it was, there, was, there was nothing wrong with that system. So um, it, it's, I think there's this mythology again. It's, it's sort of like that mythology that we were talking about earlier, that, oh, we need industrial food to, to feed the world, that, oh, we need industrial food to feed large cities. There have been large cities forever in the planet. Yeah, that's true. And they've always been fed. <clears throat> right? They wouldn't exist if they, weren't, if they hadn't been fed. Right. Okay, well, um, I do like the idea that you mentioned about talking about the the efficiencies of local farming or small scale farming versus industrial mm-hmm. farming. Um, I want to start with a quick question. How, how many families or individuals is the R table uh, program feeding either fully or partially? Oh. Well, that's a difficult question for me to answer because um, there are, so we sell food in, in many different ways. We sell food um, directly to, to our end customer, okay, to the person eating it. Um, so let's say we have a vegetable subscription program or actually, you know, just a food subscription program. It's not just vegetables, but fruit and meat and dairy and eggs and everything. Um, so that's a quite thing, system where you are saying, I want a weekly delivery of farm fresh um, product, okay, of all kinds and not just veggies, um, you know, sent to my house or to a location convenient to me, like maybe my job or something like that. Okay. Uh, now there, yeah, I can say we have, you know, 200 families that we're feeding right now with that program. Okay. Um, we also have a full service grocery store on the farm. Okay. There's, there's 40, 50, you know, maybe people coming in every single day and buying food. I don't know how many families that represents because uh, it's different people. I, see. I can't yeah. keep track of that. Um, in addition, we sell a lot of food to, to area restaurants and other grocery stores, okay? So, again, it's really difficult for me to, to, to kind of say, well, okay, we sell food to 25 different restaurants on a regular basis. How many, rest, how many people do they feed wholly or part? You know, that's hard to tell. Sure. Um, same thing that, you know, we sell, uh, let's say, a, one, a particular crop to a local grocery store. Uh, you know, I don't know how many people that serves. Let me ask you a different question then. Um, if you were to just go strictly – uh, from a calorie standpoint, and you wanted to just produce mm-hmm. as many calories mm-hmm. as you possibly could, how much, how many more calories, you know, rough estimate, if you can give me anything, would you be able to produce on your land if you, if that was all you cared about? Are we talking? Oh, like- so you're asking if, if we were using uh, chemical agriculture, how much more productive we would be essentially? Productive only in the terms of calories. Okay. Um, well, so here's the thing about about calorie. Okay, is that um, let's say let's let's I'm going to use the word yield instead of calories. Okay. okay. Um, because from a farming perspective, that's kind of what I care about. Okay. Sure. So um, the thing is with yield, which again is a little bit of a of a misconception, is that the yield of agroecological systems like ours per unit of land is actually far, far higher than the yield of industrial agriculture per unit of land. Okay, so on a per acre basis, we produce far more biomass in food than industrial agriculture does. The dis- difference and, the, re- and, the, and the, the flip side of that is that industrial agriculture is far, has a far higher yield per unit of labor. Okay? Oh. All right. Now, the reason for that is not because that labor is cleverer. The reason is that that labor is augmented by petrochemicals, right? So if I drive a large combine, I can harvest an acre of wheat in 15, 20 minutes. Sure. If you're using a scythe or a sickle and harvesting an acre of wheat, it's going to take you a couple of days, right? The, the land growing that acre of wheat, I mean, when I'm harvesting by hand and I'm doing multiple things, I can actually produce far more biomass per unit of land with more labor. That's surprising. Okay. Me. Right? So, so that's the thing. And this is a completely established fact. There's no question about this. Okay? Monocultures, large-scale industrial monocultures are very efficient per unit of labor because it takes one farmer in a thousand acres with lots of big machines and lots of chemicals, okay, to do the work that otherwise human hands would be doing. 
I can put one person on average per acre and produce far more food on a small amount of land. Now, guess what the world has a surplus of today that we keep complaining about? People. Yeah, labor. Right? We have lots of people. What we don't have is lots of oil and lots of uh, minerals and lots of uh, capacity for the planet to absorb more pollution. So did you have in mind when you mentioned the efficiencies of small-scale farming? Was there anything else you had in mind? Well, I mean, there's certainly efficiencies of supply chains, right? I mean, I can get the food to you fresher, faster, et cetera, because it's not, um, you know, sitting around or, or going through long transportation networks. Uh, it also means that I can get it to you with higher nutritional content because I'm picking it at its peak of freshness. It also means that I'm growing varieties uh, that are much better suited um, to that sort of microclimate in my neighborhood and my land. Whereas if I'm growing a monoculture, I have maybe three different varieties of wheat available to me worldwide nowadays. So it doesn't really matter if they're, if they're well adapted to my land or to my microclimate or not. This is the variety you're going to grow, period, done, finished, right? Works better in some places than other places, but too bad for that. Yeah. Right? So, so you're, again, you're working against nature because in nature, even if I have the same thing, a uh, same crop that let's say that uh, let's take a common garden crop like a tomato or something, right? There's millions and millions of home gardeners who plant tomatoes in their backyards, right? Yeah. If they save seeds, right, and they're not buying new seed packets every single year, you know, b- between two neighbors right next door to each other, there's going to be differences within that same tomato. They may have started with the same seed packet, but over the years, if they're saving seed, that tomato plant will adapt to the local conditions of that particular backyard. That's evolution, right? Um, and you're going to get minor differences between them. And, you know, over the millions, you're going to get lots of differences. So you're going to get adapt- adaptation. You're working with nature, right? Because which seed are you going to save? You're going to save the seed of the best-looking tomato, not the one that, looked, that, that barely grew. So you're naturally selecting every single year as a, as a, as a backyard gardener the better tomato, and, you're, and it's the one that's adapted better to your backyard, so, so, you know, that's the other thing we lose with this industrialization, right? Because there's like two or three different kinds of seed available. I mean, most people are growing the exact same corn all over the planet now. And that's, that's really scary for many, many reasons. It's, it's dangerous because, of course, if, if a particular disease evolves to take advantage of some kind of genetic weakness in that particular corn, it affects the whole planet. And this is happening with bananas today, by the way. Okay? And it happened with bananas in the past where, you know, all the banana growers on the planet, essentially, other than some, some, of, some Latin American countries where bananas are such a major part of their diet that they have lots and lots of different kinds of varieties, uh, most of the bananas on the planet today are a single variety, right? And uh, when diseases come, as they did about 40 or 50 years ago, um, you know, the, almost the entire worldwide banana crop was wiped out. So some university types got together, breeders got together, and they developed a variety that was resistant to that disease, and that's the modern banana. Well, there's another disease that's, on in, that's sort of taking hold right now in the modern banana, and they figure that in a decade or so, we won't have that Cavendish banana that everybody's used to anymore. Wow. Okay, so that's a big danger of having a single, basically, gene pool all over the planet. Instead of having adapted gene pools, which gives you far more resiliency. So these are the things that people sort of forget, you know, and don't really realize. Um, it reminds me of the potato famine in... Um, yes. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, we're at threat of having similar things happen. It definitely makes sense to me. I know that, you know, corn, and you mentioned bananas and mm-hmm. soybeans, these are all essentially the same crops. And what is also scary about it is that if they're genetically modified, and I'm aware that the farmers aren't even allowed to save the seeds... So right. So, I mean, it's, it's okay if everybody in the world is growing corn for whatever reason, but if they're saving their own, if farmers are saving their own seeds or maybe groups of farmers in a particular community are saving their own seed, then you get adaptation and you get differences within the different varieties and you get um, a resiliency. But with commercially produced, specially genetically modified seed that's patented, where farmers are, it's illegal for farmers to save seed, then it's being produced essentially in a lab and they're all identical genetic clones of each other. So you get rid of, you, you essentially say, well, there's no more natural selection going on. That's a really bad idea. Yeah, it sounds like a terrible idea. So just kind of summarizing some of the points that I, I, I feel I'm taking from this conversation is that industrial agriculture is winning, or not necessarily winning, but it has a role in our current society because it's less expensive. And it's less expensive because there's, not labor involved or there's less 
human labor mm-hmm. and all of that. Mm-hmm. It's highly no, efficient for a unit of labor. Yeah. Knowing that most consumers are going to just look at products and compare them by the price tag if they're not able to see any other significant differences between them, what do you mm-hmm. think needs to happen for a change to take place and for more sustainable agriculture to really become a major part of our society? Well, I think the only way that can happen, and, and you know, that's a very good question, is at some level our awareness and connection with the fact that what we put in our bodies has an impact on our health. Right? And I think that's happening. Uh, much to the chagrin of, let's say, you know, fast food and soda companies today, which are directly tied to industrial agriculture, right? Those things wouldn't exist without ag- industrial agriculture. So uh, I, I think whether we like it or not, people are realizing that this food has this extremely negative health consequence. Forget about ecological consequence or environmental consequence, because, of course, when you shift those in time and space, most people don't notice them, Right. I don't know what's happening on the farm in Mexico that my peppers come from. I don't really care. I don't, I've never been there. I'm not going to see that guy, right? Um, but the, if, if, if my health is suffering and my family's health and my community's health is suffering, then at some level people start to take notice. And I think, you know, there's a growing um, sort of movement of, of people realizing that what we put in our bodies on a daily basis has a giant impact on our health. I mean, it's, a, it's an obvious connection, but we lost it in the last 50, 60 years. So I think, uh, you know, human health is the avenue through which people are starting to ask these questions and make these connections. And until people make those connections, for whatever reason, however they get to it, you know, we, we're stuck with the current system. And from a governmental perspective or policy perspective, what changes would you like to see take place? Well, I would like to see, you know, less subsidies for commodity kind of farming that encourages this this uh, highly destructive form of agriculture. And we didn't even talk about how animals are raised in this factory system, which is just disgusting, you know, and, and very, very costly in terms of environmental footprint. Um, not because, you know, I mean, yes, we, Americans eat way too much meat. We all know that. Um, but it's not that meat is, is inherently bad. In fact, one of the, the best solutions to the problem of climate change today is better grazing practices for our you know, livestock. And I think that that's a real win-win kind of thing. The best way to capture carbon today is not by some high-tech, goofy methods that have unintended consequences, but by rotational grazing and holistic management of, of pastures. It captures more carbon in the, you know, we can capture more carbon in the soil by building soil carbon than any other single method. It's far more effective than planting trees, okay? Forests are not good carbon sinks in the long run. Pastures are. Wow. Soil is. So, you know, we know what the solution is, and it's a win-win. That's the sad part. You know, never mind what caused greenhouse gas emissions and, and whether it was you or me or whether I did more of it so I should pay for more of it. I mean, it, at, the, at some level, that's a moot point, right? Uh, I mean, it's important, but at some level, we have to sort of go for forward and go, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, the solution is staring us in the face, and it's not high tech. The solution is better pasture management and rotational grazing and agroecology so that instead of burning soil carbon, which is what industrial agriculture does, we capture soil carbon, which is what more organic agriculture does. Okay? Plants are the best way to take carbon dioxide out of the air and put it into the soil. And the soil has an immense capacity to store carbon. And over the, over the last, let's say, 100 years, we've gone from soil organic matter levels of 10 12% down to like 2 or 3%. Wow. And it sounds like, oh, that's only 10%, but it, the, the quantities are immense. And it's, if we were to, able to build back soil organic matter and quality of our soil, not only would we get better quality soil and therefore better yields and better crops, but we would also capture the vast majority of excess carbon in the air today. The numbers add up. The, the math works. It's all very possible. So what can government do? You know, right there subsidize or maybe stop the subsidies on the monocrops and stop subsidies on. on one thing and start to sort of build the infrastructure to, to, to scale up the other. Right? Okay. All right. I want to shift the conversation here for just a moment mm-hmm. to sure. um, the idea of using local agriculture to few, to feed large communities. Say if we had mm-hmm. a community of 250,000 people or even larger, mm-hmm. what would it take for a majority of the food to feed that community to be sourced locally in a sustainable way 
you know, maybe some, okay, some so special let, So let me give you an example. Somebody in um, Oregon, which is the state I'm in, yep. uh, did a little study to figure out what, how much land would it take um, around the, and, and Oregon's, the uh, vast majority of Oregon's population is constituted around the sort of Portland urban area, okay, Portland, Eugene are the two major cities. Uh, that's where the vast majority of the people are, okay? So somebody did a study to figure out, and, and both those cities, by the way, are in the are on two ends of the same river valley, the Willamette River Valley. Okay, um, so they're very connected in that sense, and they're only a couple hours, you know, maybe a hundred miles apart. Uh, so somebody did a study saying, well, what would it take to feed all of these people from our local system? And they figured out that it would take, I believe, it was four million acres. So for all for all of the food. And and I could be off by 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 a, by a factor of ten here in my numbers because I don't remember them offhand. But the the end result is not the actual number. It's that it's a it was a fractional minuscule amount of land compared to the amount of land in the state that's that that's available for agriculture. So the in this river valley that these two major cities are on is ten times larger than the amount of land it would take to feed the entire state. So the land's so there. This, the land is there. Okay, it's highly fertile. The water is there. Everything is there. This is not a problem of natural resources. This is a problem of of human society. We have created economic and agricultural and sort of, you know, uh, you know, industrial systems, just systems in general, right? Societal systems that don't don't make this work, that don't work. They're failures. It's time for us to rethink them. So, you know, can we feed the 250,000 people? Absolutely, no problem. We have the people, we have the land, we have the know-how. What we don't have is the will. It seems like a lot of it is uh, also just from education as well. I consider myself to be, you know, at least decently versed in the food conversation. It's important to me. But just Mm -hmm. from speaking with you for the last 50 minutes, I've learned so many new things that I think are very valuable that everybody should know. Uh, yes, I agree. And, and I mean, I think, that, you know, and, and you can argue the same thing. You know, I might know a few things about farming, but I don't know a lot about, let's say, healthcare or, you know, some other systems. So I, I think generally speaking, we as a species have become very disconnected with the systems that kind of uh, support us, right? Whether that's energy or food or, or anything else. And, and as a result, we, we live, uh, you know, in, in sort of isolation from these things and we don't realize what, they, what they're all about. So we're very easy to manipulate. Right. Okay. So if, if we are successful and we make this transition to mm-hmm. a, a food economy that's predominantly local sourced, what does that mean to the end consumer, both from the pros and cons? How much, is food, how much would food costs rise and how much mm-hmm. more nutrition or value or other benefits would they be deriving from the food? So I think there's no question that the dollar cost of food uh, on a daily basis would have to rise. Okay, and people, and this is what sort of blocks a lot of conversation on this issue, because when when you say that, people have two one of two reactions. One is, well, what about all the people who can barely afford, uh, you know, the cheap calories that the industrial system produces today? Basically, uh, it's a it, what they're saying is that what about poverty, right? And right. that's a very very important issue. So we, let's 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 hold that for one second. The the second thing that people say is, well, blah, if it's going to cost more, no one's going to do it, right? So let's, let's, let's talk first about the issue of access and poverty, which is a very real issue, okay? So yes, definitely, if I was to say that the, the true cost of food is, let's say, I'm going to just throw out a, a really high figure just for, for conversational purposes, okay? Let's say it's double of what, it is to, of what industrial food is today. Okay? Wouldn't surprise me. Right? So let's say it's double, all right? So, so let's say that, okay, food has to double in cost. Now, well, what about all the poor people? Well, that's a very good question, but that is not a problem of food. That is, a pro- that is a much larger problem of our society and our economic system, right? Real wages in this country, inflation adjusted, have not risen in 35 years, okay? We, we have a poverty problem that is completely separate from the cost of food, right? No, now, we, st- we have a poverty problem, but yet healthcare costs and housing costs have skyrocketed and nobody sort of says, well, that's, you know, we should really have lower housing costs because, you know, poor people can't afford it. I mean, they say that, but on the fringes, right? That, that's not the major, majority conversation. Yet when we talk about food, it's always like, oh, 
it's the it's the food systems problem that some people can't afford the true cost, right? So I, I don't believe that's a food system problem. That is a societal problem of poverty, and that needs to be addressed definitely. But it's not something that the food system alone can solve, and it doesn't help by saying that oh we're gonna. So you know one of the supreme ironies of our table is that. Even though we try and charge for our food what it truly costs us to produce, the fact is that we are still, you know, open to market forces that force us to price our food far lower than we would like. Okay, the result of that, because seventy percent of our cost is labor, is that our own farmers are not paid enough to really afford the food that we're producing. That's crazy. So that that is, you know, that's really really disturbing for us, obviously, for obvious reasons, right? But if we were to really pay our farmers a true living wage, and, and I'm, I'm going to throw out some numbers at you. Our, our average wage, uh, you know, is about $26,000 a year, okay, for our farmers. Now, that is not a high wage by any stretch of the imagination in America today, right? I wouldn't call it a living wage. So if I was to pay a living wage, let's say that's double of that, right? A living wage for a family, let's say it's double of what we're paying today. Well, that would imply that we have to re- increase our prices by at least 70%. Right. But we're not really able to do that. So, and, and we're not, you know, you can argue, well, maybe you're a little inefficient here or there. Yes, there might be ways that we could be a little bit more efficient. But at the end of the day, I, as I mentioned to you, 70% of our cost is labor. So even if we got rid of that other 30%, we still have to have the people. So there's something fundamentally broken here, Right. And, that, and so that gets to that second issue of, well, you know, people aren't going to agree to a larger cost. So let me get, throw out some figures. The average American household today spends more on cable TV and cell phone than food. Wow. This is a historical anomaly, okay? Other countries in the world, you know, industrialized countries, uh, people spend 13 to 15% of their income on food. In America, it's less than 9%, okay, of the income spent on food. So... That's not a, uh, something to cheer about. It's not to say, oh, look at that. The food system was so efficient, the industrial food system, that we got cheap food. No, because the, the costs got externalized. They got moved into a different column in the household budget called health care, right? Mm-hmm. They got moved into sort of a societal column called environmental de- destruction, which we don't have to pay for out of our household budgets on a daily basis directly. We pay for it indirectly. So... Um, you know, it's, 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 this cost issue is a very complex issue that's very, very tied to sort of society in general. And I don't think you can solve it in isolation. Um, do I, having said that, I will say straight out, I believe that people need to pay a higher percentage of their income on food. Food is a necessity. Okay? It's not a luxury. I'm not talking about swanky food. You don't have to eat oysters every day. That's not what we're talking about. And I would not consider a locally grown uh, carrot to be a luxury. Right. Yeah. That seems like okay. a necessity to me. So, yeah, so it, it, it should be a right. Good, well, nutritious food should be a right. You know, the, the poverty question notwithstanding, which is a larger societal issue, yes, people need to pay more of their income for food. Yes, that means they will have less left over to buy other stuff. I don't think that's a problem. I mean, I, I, I carry a smartphone. I'm sure you do too, right? Yep. yep. Okay. Everybody I know around me, like, I mean, it doesn't matter, rich or poor, minimum wage workers, they're all carrying these smartphones. I mean, it's become such a ubiquitous thing nowadays, yeah. right? But the cell phone plan costs at least 50 to 60 bucks, you know, a, a month per phone, right? Now, this is a value. This is we've chosen. Now, I'm old enough to remember a world without smartphones. I am very attached to mine. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> okay? But, but I'm old enough to remember a world without them, and I don't remember being particularly unhappy all the time, going, you know, oh, God, I wish I had this little thing in my pocket that was buzzing all the time, right? So, so this is a, a cultural value thing, and I'm not saying that, oh, poor people shouldn't have smartphones. Not at all. What I'm saying is that we as a society, rich and poor, have decided that this is something valuable, and we're willing to spend money on it. It's the same thing with food. If we decide that that food is valuable, then we'll spend money on that. It's a choice. Now, of course, the rich will have more choices than the poor. But that goes back to that societal problem that I don't believe that there should be such a giant discre- discrepancy between rich and poor. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a different social issue. Yeah, but I think that they are interconnected. Yes, they are inter- interconnected. So, and yes, you know, but the, the price that we charge for our food, which is more accurate and reflective of the actual cost of production, means that it is less affordable for the unfortunate people who don't have the money to pay for it today. Okay, that, that is true, and that is very, very disconcerting for us. I mean, our own farmers are in that position. 
So it's not something that's, that's sort of, you know, removed from our thinking. It's on a daily basis it affects us. Well, Narendra, this has been a very excellent conversation. I appreciate you coming on the interview with me. Uh, with just a couple of minutes left, I want to ask you if there's anything else you would like to mention to our listeners or maybe even a call to action that you would like to give before we say goodbye. Um, no, I don't believe so. I, all I would say to listeners is, you know, thank you for listening, A, and, uh, and, and B, just sort of, you know, educate yourselves and, and build relationships. It, at the end of the day, life is about, you know, the richness of life is about human relationships whether that's relationships in your community, uh, you know, with, with food providers or non-food providers. I think building relationships is what gets us to the right place over time. All right, excellent. And to all of our listeners, uh, you can visit verticalcity.org slash podcast for links to everything we've discussed, show notes, and of course, links to our table as well. Narendra, thank you again for joining me on the podcast. It was an excellent conversation. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Vertical City. Learn more about the Vertical City concept and continue the conversation by visiting our website, verticalcity.org. I truly hope that you've enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe to our podcast, leave a review on iTunes, and most importantly, share Vertical City with your friends and colleagues so that together we can create solutions for sustainable living. I'm Lennon Richardson, signing off for the Vertical City team. See you next time.